Get ready to have your mind blown at the reveal of villainous gangster ink, dodgy lightsaber throws, and more Ewok details than you ever knew you needed in your life. It's time to take a closer look at all things episode 6, my friends, because I am Gareth here from What Culture Star Wars, and here are 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 6 Return of the Jedi. Number 20, Yoda is the only Jedi to die of natural causes on screen. Over the years, the likes of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jinn, Luke Skywalker, and many more have either sacrificed themselves to help protect a hopeful future, or have simply been cut down by the forces of evil in the galaxy on screen. In fact, pretty much every Jedi ever to pop up in a Star Wars movie has found themselves passing over to the other side after being killed or sacrificing themselves at one point or another. All except one. And said only moment of a Jedi passing away due to natural causes comes during Return of the Jedi as a rather ill Master Yoda eventually pops his clogs after living to the ripe old age of 900. After taking a similar amount of time to squeeze out his final few lines, of course. Number 19, the first on-screen female droid. While Phoebe Waller-Bridge's L337 may act as the first real primary female droid to make their presence known in the galaxy far, far away, doing so in Solo, a Star Wars story, she wasn't actually the first lady droid to appear on our screens. It took two whole movies before George Lucas and the gang found a way to unleash Star Wars' first notable droid that didn't identify as a male, with Episode 6 debuting EV-99 during C-3PO and R2-D2's time as Jabba the Hutt's new gifts, coldly ordering the famous protocol droid and Astromech to act as Jabba's new interpreter and accompany him on his sail barge, respectively. EV-99's chilling debut came equipped with the first moving droid mouth, too. The Mandalorian fans will also likely recognize the droid for her brief appearances in the series, whilst working as a bartender in the wake of being reprogrammed after Jabba's death, with Mark Hamill voicing the female droid on this occasion. Number 18, a director ATSD cameo. After George Lucas and Irving Kirshner had directed the prior two entries into the Skywalker saga, it was over to Richard Mark I to lead the final chapter of the original trilogy. And while Lucas and Kirshner would resist the urge to throw themselves into the Star Wars goodness for a throwaway cameo during their time in the director's seat, before the former would go all blue in episode 3 of course, Mark I did find a way to subtly get in on the on-screen action. As Return of the Jedi reaches its thrilling climax on Endor, look closely at the Imperial folks steering the AT-ST through the the Forest Moon. The late Marquand, whose character went by that same name in Legends Continuity, before being rechristened Newland, would proceed to be battered by a few Ewoks in the end, before Chewbacca hijacked his destructive vehicle. Number 17, Lando's Disappearing Gloves. With so many bodies flying through the air and folks meeting their Sarlacc doom during the thrilling mission that takes up the movie's first act, you'd be forgiven for missing a rather tiny detail amidst the madness. Keep an eye on a flailing Lando Calrissian as the smooth-talking figure is launched off the side of a barge above the Dune Sea, or more specifically, his hands. As Lando hangs on for dear life in the immediate aftermath of being sent overboard, Billy Dee Williams' character is seen sporting a pair of black gloves. Then, when the scene cuts to more close-up shots of the star, Lando is very much gloveless. This was likely down to William's stunt double needing the mitts to protect his own during the dangling moment more than anything else. Or perhaps Lando just possesses the ability to quickly glove and unglove in the blink of an eye. I vote the former. Number 16, it's the only Skywalker saga movie not to contain a blue lightsaber. There was actually a time when Luke Skywalker was going to be seen sporting yet another blue lightsaber over the course of Episode 6, with the leading figure being found wielding that very colour of blade on the film's original posters, and during the Return of the Jedi's teaser trailers too. Ultimately, the call was reportedly made to change up that hue due to the blade clashing with the blue sky above during the opening Tatooine sequence. And in swapping out the blue for the green for Luke's new lightsaber, Return of the Jedi ended up becoming the only Skywalker saga feature not to showcase a blue variation of the same sacred weapon, if you don't count those early posters and promotional material, which I do not. Number 15, Luke's Obi-Wan lightsaber connection. It turns out that Luke Skywalker's sparkly new green lightsaber also had a rather interesting and easily overlooked connection to his fallen masters. As revealed many years down the road during Mark Hamill's pop culture quest show, the prop the star used when battling against Vader on the second Death Star was actually the very same one Sir Alec Guinness wielded as his special effects lightsaber in A New Hope. Along with being a fantastic piece of behind-the-scenes trivia, this weapon actually being a reused version of one of Guinness's props brilliantly connects the canon backstory of Luke using materials and notes found in Obi-Wan's home on Tatooine to create his new blade to the lightsaber action seen in episode 6 too. Number 14, the real-world inspiration behind various alien languages. 
Part of what helps make the galaxy far, far away feel like a vibrant, multicultural universe is the fact that not all characters within it speak English, or galactic basic as it's known in the Star Wars sphere. When it comes to the many alien languages heard being spoken over the course of the Skywalker saga and beyond though, the majority of these seemingly extraterrestrial native tongues have far more earthy origins than you likely realised. In Return of the Jedi alone, Huttese, the language spoke by the mighty Jabba the Hutt, was based on Quechua, the main language of the Incan Empire. Elsewhere, Lando's co-pilot Nian Nyum is seen speaking Kikuyu, a regional Kenyan language, whenever he unleashes his native Sulustan tongue. And lastly, the Ewokese heard in the picture was inspired heavily by the Tibetan and Kalmyk Oret languages. Number 13, Blinking Ewoks in the Blu-ray Edition. The little furry balls of fury known as the Ewoks could regularly be found providing the cuteness and taking down many an Imperial in Return of the Jedi. What you would not have caught one of the Endor natives doing, however, was, well, blinking. Not until the release of the updated Blu-ray editions of the original trilogy in 2011 at least. According to Warwick Davis when having a chat on Return of the Jedi's Blu-ray commentary, the original plan was to use a mechanism that allowed the Ewoks to practically blink on set while shooting. However, that didn't work out, so the call was made to just leave the teddy bear staring into our souls during each and every one of their appearances. Fast forward a few years though and George Lucas found a way to tinker away this surreal detail, producing an even more bizarre CGI blink whenever the aliens were enjoying a close-up. Number 12, Ewoks are never mentioned by name. And speaking of Ewoks, nobody ever did precisely that in the entirety of this 132-minute OG trilogy finale. That's right, they may have been one of the major reasons the Rebels were ultimately able to take down the Empire once and for all, at this point anyway, but not a single alien or human on screen ever once referenced the names of the furry little race seen battering many a stormtrooper in Episode 6. Thankfully, the creatures and some of their specific names were at least mentioned in the film's end credits, but the fact the likes of Han, Leia, Luke and 3PO never once uttered the name of the race, or deliver a throwaway cheers wicket, is often easily overlooked when thinking about their part in the Return of the Jedi story. Number 11, a familiar canine helped create the Rancor's growls. With one blood-curdling roar, Jabba the Hutt's rancor quickly established itself as one of the most fearsome beasts ever to stomp its way through the galaxy far, far away. In truth though, those horrifying screams actually had some rather diminutive real-world origins. Listen closely and you may be able to catch what sounds like a rather low-pitched bark slash growl from a canine. Far from sitting next to a ferocious Rottweiler or German Shepherd and capturing their intimidating growls for their towering rancor though, sound designer Ben Burt actually recorded the sound of his neighbor's little dash and barking before lowering the pitch to produce the beastie's sound. And just like that, you'll never look at this giant pet the same way again. Number 10, Vader's Upside Down Lightsaber. Nothing says tough love quite like launching your lightsaber at your baby boy in the middle of a deadly duel on the Death Star 2. But if you slow down that very moment of the one-time Anakin Skywalker hurling his trusty weapon at Luke with the Emperor watching on, it soon becomes clear that there was something a little off about this father-son experience, besides from the obvious. On closer inspection, Vader's lightsaber is actually shown to be emitting the weapon's laser blade out of the wrong end when flying through the air. But Lucas appears to have still found a way to ignore this rather strange error in his many OG trilogy updates. CGI eyelids for Ewoks though, well you got it. Number 9, is that you Captain Rex? On the back of a welcome return to the animated Star Wars sphere throughout the Rebels series, Captain Rex was ultimately confirmed in the show's epilogue to have been present during the Battle of Endor seen going down in Return of the Jedi. So that appeared to all but confirm that the bearded soul known as Nick Sant, seen gunning down stormtroopers and joining forces with Ewoks in Episode 6, was actually the legendary clone trooper who once fought alongside Anakin Skywalker. Despite Rebels executive producer Dave Filoni at one time feeling this was most definitely the case, however, the series ultimately left this particular revelation somewhat open to interpretation. With it not 100% being confirmed that the bearded rebel was Rex and not Sand, and Filoni being fine with the fact that he quote unquote left it in a state where you could believe one way or the other. Number 8, Luke has the high ground. Returning to Luke's fateful duel with his old man now, and to an easily missed nod to the past that initially meant very little to the average Star Wars fan back in 1983. Fast forward a few decades to the time post-release of Revenge of the Sith though, and the green-bladed Skywalker's decision to take a rather specific position now brings back some particularly painful Mustafar memories. As Vader notes how Obi-Wan has taught you well, notice how Luke very much has the high ground after knocking the half-machine Sith down some steps. Kenobi of course took up a similar position 
position in the lead up to Anakin's arrogant decision to launch himself at his one time master amidst the lava in episode 3. And Vader's apparent remembering of that life changing mistake during this equally important moment helps subtly connect the two trilogy endings and significant events in his life with a once throwaway line. Number 7 Stormtroopers Drag Through the Street in Celebration with the galaxy finally safe from the villainous rule of the Empire, updated versions of Return of the Jedi famously offered a few glimpses at the celebrations taking place on planets such as Naboo, Tatooine and Coruscant. But it was on that last planet that a rather chilling visual was dragged under the noses of the majority of folks taking in these joyful parties. Coruscant, aka Imperial Center, was famously the capital under the Emperor's rule. Yet the minute said Dark Lord of the Sith was toppled, the civilians on that world went about tearing down his statue and a full blown riot was said to have eventually broken out, one that saw the killing of a number of civilians at the hands of the police force on the planet. In episode 6 however, fans only really see the beginnings of that riot. With the aforementioned statue tumbling and a stormtrooper being dragged through the crowd in Monument Plaza, as a Wilhelm scream can briefly be heard in the thick of the cheers. Number 6 It's the only time Luke addresses his master as Obi-Wan after watching the all-powerful Master Yoda become one with the Force within his tiny home on Dagobah, Luke Skywalker wanders right into a pretty awkward conversation with one of his other deceased masters. That's when Luke suddenly calls out to this fallen Jedi, referring to the Force spirit as Obi-Wan for the first and only time during the pair's time spent together on screen during the original trilogy. Though you would be forgiven for overlooking that detail amongst all the certain point of view nonsense and sister revelations said conversation also contained. Yet Luke would then return to calling his truth-bending master Ben during that same exchange. So perhaps this was just a brief moment of frustration being let out by the reeling Jedi in the making, on the back of having his world flipped upside down by Vader's father Bombshell. Still think he handled that rather well. Number 5. Anakin's Skeleton is Briefly Visible Darth Vader finally edges back towards the light side by dumping the wrinkly a-hole he once called Master down a reactor shaft late in Return of the Jedi. In the wake of a few special edition additional cries of no though, many fans were too busy cringing in their seats or punching the air in joy at the sight of Darth Sidious being gorilla pressed by the man-machine to spot a particularly awesome detail during this galaxy changing moment. As Vader impressively lifts the Emperor with one good hand, Anakin Skywalker's skeleton can sporadically be seen as the hooded Sith's shocks fire through his system. Then, after eventually launching Sidious, the Chosen One's massively augmented frame is once again visible for a few seconds as he takes a quick breather post-throw, highlighting many of the robotic elements that have been installed into his skeleton. Obi-Wan wasn't wrong. His former Padawan was very much more machine than man at this point. Number 4. Jabba the Tat the slimy Jabba the Hutt more than made an impact during his various appearances in the original trilogy. Yet despite it often being pretty hard to take your eyes off of this massive gangster slug whenever he wriggled onto the scene, most didn't actually catch a subtle detail on the Hutt's person throughout his impactful Return of the Jedi moment in particular. As the criminal Empire leader is found drooling over Princess Leia, roaring at 3PO within his palace, and chilling on his sail barge, his right forearm is actually shown to be boasting an easily missed tattoo. Said ink is said to be of the Desilijic Kaji symbol, a mark that highlighted Jabba's role as the leader of the Desilijic Tyor clan. Try saying that 10 times fast. Number 3 is the only film where Vader doesn't unleash a force choke. Almost as iconic as the sound of the most recognizable force of evil in the galaxy's breathing is the sight of Darth Vader using the force to cut off an unsuspecting fool's air supply. But in a move that perhaps reflected how the one-time Anakin Skywalker had been spending the entire movie edging back towards the light, Vader isn't actually seen choking any Imperials or Rebels throughout Return of the Jedi. Had the decision been made to leave in one of Episode 6's deleted scenes, however, the Emperor's right-hand man would have maintained his 100% choking record in Star Wars movies. With Vader originally gripping Commander Jajerod via the Force after not being granted access to his master's throne room. Rookie mistake. Said choke never made the cut though, so Return of the Jedi still sits as the only choke-free entry on Vader's big screen CV. Number 2. Only one X-Wing pilot survived all three original trilogy movies. Time and time again during the Rebel Alliance's attempts to take the Empire down once and for all, a great many brave pilots were suddenly blown to smithereens by everything from enemy TIE fighters to Star Destroyers. Throughout all of the perilous missions to take out Death Stars and AT-ATs though, one mighty Rebel X-Wing pilot managed to keep from somehow biting the dust. Sitting as the only X-Wing flying character outside of Luke Skywalker to survive all three original trilogy movies, Wedge Antilles could always be counted on to keep his cool when the pressure was at its highest. And the unkill 
unkillable pilots would even pop up many years later alongside old pal Lando Calrissian during the Resistance's Exegol attack on the First Order during the closing stages of The Rise of Skywalker. What a hero! Number 1. 2 million plus deaths in total go down and Lando was responsible for most of them. Peace came at quite the price during the events of Return of the Jedi, with a grand total of 2,218,448 individuals all ultimately dying during the Rebel Alliance's successful overthrowing of the Empire. The most notable of those deaths undoubtedly came in the form of Darth Vader, Yoda, Jabba the Hutt, and the Emperor for a bit at least. Yet what is often ignored is precisely who was responsible for the vast majority of that astronomical number of fatalities during Episode 6. General Lando Calrissian held the chilling record of being the deadliest individual Return of the Jedi had to offer, murdering a grand total of 1,844,137 people when blasting the Empire's second space station to smithereens, according to List of Deaths Wiki. At least it wasn't all for nothing and the Empire were finally wiped from the galaxy for good after being left with all that blood on his hands slash gloves though. Oh, oh wait, no, that didn't happen. Ah, so much for that then. And that's our list. Know any other things that folks have likely missed from Return of the Jedi? Let us know all about them in the comment section right down below and do not forget to like, share and click on that subscribe button while you're down there. Also, if you love this sort of easily missed detailed stuff, then please head on over to whatculture.com and find some more fantastic articles just like the one this video you're watching right this second is based on. I've been Padawan Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. May the force be with you. Thank you very much for stopping on by and hopefully we'll meet again. Bye-bye.